Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Apex Hour. I'm here once again with my co-host, 2OP and The Count. And today we're just going to be talking about games, like lots of games. We've all been playing a bunch of different things. And there's quite a few things right around the corner that we're all very excited for. And so, yeah, that's pretty much the week. And OP is going to get us started because he's actually been playing Anthem, which is uh, <laughs> he's been playing Anthem. I'm actually excited to hear what you have to say about it. All right, so Anthem was one of those games on the radar for a while, but Apex came out, and you know I got I got sucked up in Apex, and you know I've been needing some time off Apex, getting burnt out, and I'm like, let's let's, let's finally give Anthem a shot. It was on sale, so you know it's like, let's, let's yeah, <laughs> let's let's try it out, and so I tested it out, and the story is not my favorite, but the gameplay, man, I'm I'm loving the gameplay. It's the the combat feels so good the the sounds just feel so good and i don't know man it's something about that game i'm i'm loving every bit of it it's such it's totally like an eye candy game you know it's yeah it's, it's like got like it definitely lacks like the substance um to be like and i won't say i'm not saying content it just it, like once you get into the end game i think the reason the game like actually fell off as quickly as it did wasn't because they didn't have like the content plans they needed to have but because like almost all of the systems in the game aren't actually that replayable, you know, like I feel like if the game had more depth across its like loot and everything and more variety with like its weapons and its gear and stuff, it's one of those games you could just play like forever because I played it probably for way longer than uh, I should have <laughs> considering what's there because like you said, it's just dude like the flying is phenomenal. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, like the the sound design is great. Like when you're in the thick of it, it's just a really satisfying experience that is pretty unique. Like you don't really you don't have like flying games like this. You know, it is essentially like an Iron Man game. I, I was so, playing as yeah. Colossus, and it was it was so fun. And I switched to Interceptor, and Interceptor is the new love. There's a lot I'm of curious too, based on what you guys write. So Tony, you played a lot of it at launch, right? And I think they've they've done some quality of life improvements. I haven't. You know necessarily jumped in myself but OG, i'm curious on your take too that since you're jumping in necessarily after some of those changes have mm -hmm. have come in how you guys compare sort of like the launch experience versus the state of that game now uh, uh yeah I mean, I mean i've like jumped back in and like seen the changes and unfortunately I mean, I guess it was, it's a matter of like how many bugs you ran into at launch. <laughs> you know, like on a personal level. I didn't have an ultra buggy experience for the most part on PC. It was definitely worse on console for a lot of people. Um, it, it ran. What kind of bugs are we talking about? Like game break, like game crashing, or just like minor, like just the, immersion breaking? Mostly just immersion breaking stuff and stuff that it was actually pretty frustrating. There's some that are still in the game that they haven't dealt with. Like, the game like feels good it's like but it's definitely one of those things where you know op you kind of talk about like the longer you you play the game the more you see its flaws well that should usually typically yeah. happen like when you've got like five or six hundred hours in the game not when you've got like 50. Right. like when you hit the 50 hour mark all those bugs you start to realize just how happen happen how often they happen and one of the big ones that always drove me crazy is there's a bug with the way frost affects the player in this game so when you get hit with a frost status effect it's supposed to freeze you the problem is it'll lock up your javelin in a weird way where you're frozen, but you're still able to move. And I don't think they've been able to fix that. And there's several, there's probably a handful of bugs like that in the game that are still there. And while I adore the gameplay, when I went back to play the most recent Stronghold when they added it, that's like the first thing I noticed was like, the game might look polished and it feels polished, but there's like a dozen or so bugs that really make it feel like a frustrating experience. You know, if you're in the hundred hour range that that happened to me last night actually i got well it was weird because i got frozen i was able to keep flying but i couldn't control and i flew out of bounds and i had to wait for that like two minute loading screen oh, the loading no. screens have been one of my biggest complaints yeah they're pretty bad on console still they're yeah. they're better they're okay on pc they're much better now um i think one of the big problems is still the fact that it's like it's just a stagnant loading screen you know I kind of talked about that uh, with the game at launch and it really is like the game is such it's one of those situations now that we know everything that happened in development with like just the poor management on you know bioware's leaders end um it all makes sense right because like there's a bunch of like cool ideas there and the core 
is like halfway executed really really well we were like oh had they actually been able to like look at destiny and diablo and monster hunter while they were developing the game they would have not made all of the mistakes they made like on the loot side of things and you know they probably wouldn't have had all the problems they've had with like restarting development and stuff like that and it's just like <laughs> the loading screen just literally comes on it cuts off the thing that always kills me is it cuts off the really cool animation of you leaving the airlock when you leave fort tarsus just <laughs> yeah. to give you a stationary loading screen it's like one of those super just like you know obviously they just never got around to it type things where it's like it would make a lot more sense for that that you know the whole animation should play over the top of the loading screen but it just doesn't dude the, the exp system throws me off too man like, like just just getting yeah experience just the, the how you have to get you have to do these random objectives to get your xp that you get at the end of the mission so it's just strange i feel i don't know I'm yeah not a huge fan of that. i get like they what they're trying to do they didn't want to make a thing where you just go out and farm kills to get experience mm -hmm. um and i don't mind it like it's one of those things that i don't think bothered me in the long run it was pretty easy to like get leveled and stuff like that it definitely wasn't something that became an issue um especially because once you cap out that's like it you know you hit level cap and then there's no reason to really worry about experience beyond that so but it, it's yeah just one of those so things. what is what's the end game loop like in that game so like what do you, you know i mean you reach max level what are you do what are you doing in that game nowadays to, to you run keep grinding running or? strongholds um and that's like where a lot of the game's problems come into play then is like there's a decent amount of content there like you know they added the the another stronghold which actually has a pretty cool boss set piece you're actually in this so you're in the middle of basically a freaking like ocean um, but it has these generators that are turning the water into a wall and you're down in this pit then and so you look up and there's just this crazy ocean up above you um, and then you fight a fury which is one of the creatures we know about but then you just like run into the issue of like the mechanics aren't really that interesting the ai is pretty haphazard the majority of the time and the loot pool is is just like not interesting like if if all of those things could be like resolved if they could go back in and really like refine the loot which is just there's just so much work on that on that end you know and like tweak the ai i think all the content that's like there now would be really fun to play because of those core gameplay mechanics you know the flying and the hovering and like you said op you know you talked about switching off the colossus to the interceptor that's like one of the best things the game does is every, javelins feel completely unique in terms of like their movement and the way they function it's just when you get down to like really refining, you know, your little play style, you're super limited. Like I made three loadout videos for the Colossus. I could have made more, but at that point, you're just like using gear that is so bad for the sake of making a loadout, you know, like <laughs> yeah. you just kind of cap yeah, out at like, bad. here's three good loadouts. Uh, and, and that's like it. So uh, it runs out there. It's like, I mean, you probably, you'll probably feel like, did you get to cap yet OP? no nope still working on i it. feel like so when you get to cap you'll feel like you know like you, you still like i feel like i still got my money's worth out of it, you know in terms of like a playthrough it was still a lot of fun i still love the gameplay like you said it's just it's a super fun game to play at that that very core it's just it doesn't have what it takes to to really be like a functional you know loot shooter among all of the other loot shooters that are on the market right now did you hear is the that rumor? game beyond go ahead Cal. go ahead I was just gonna say, like, is that is that game beyond salvageable, or do you, or do they have a roadmap to try and to bring it back? So, they've got like a, they've they've basically just said like you know they 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 they've acknowledged like a lot of the problems, and they're just kind of like in development dark zone right now. I think you know there's like nothing they can say that they're like that they can say <laughs> like they just can't come out and talk about it. Their community managers have been pretty transparent in that regard, uh, considering how demanding gaming communities are with transparency you know they want you to tell them when the art director takes a shit uh you know and why he's not at his desk they've basically just been like you were working and that's it i think they can i think they can bring it around it's just like you know what it needs at this point is like a year maybe but it also needs a year of not the same development environment the game obviously got for seven years you know like it can't just be oh we got another year of development time but also we have the same management problems we had for the last, you know, seven years. From what right. I know, when Casey came back, Casey Hudson came back, like that was kind of supposed to be like, apparently a lot of the bad management went away and I heard like better things from some of the devs who work there right now. But, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what it's actually like, you know, I can't, 
I can't tell. I mean, they've made decent progress over the last few months considering how much stuff needs to be fixed. Uh, I, I mean, I'd love for them to have like a No Man's Sky, you know, turnaround story, but No Man's... I was just going to say that. <laughs> yeah. That's, I was yeah. thinking exactly that. The thing with No Man's Sky, though, is like it was just a game that just needed more variety, right? Like it had like mm -hmm. a content generation system and Sean Murray always knew they could get to the point that they that they had talked about. They just ran out of time and Sony was like, you got to release it. And they were like, shit, <laughs> you know, we could do all this stuff, but we need another year. And like they tweaked the core and made like the economy better. But I don't know. I, it's just hard to say, right? Because with like No Man's Sky, they just went off and did it. And I never really like actively thought about the economy improving the way that it did. Like when Next came out, the economy changes were incredible. Like before that, No Man's Sky was a very frustrating game from a progression standpoint. And then it became really enjoyable. Like, so to look at Anthem having spent so much time in it and be like, here's everything wrong. Like, you know, where do they go? I just, I just don't know. I, I hope they can do it though. I'll tell you what, if I'm a developer nowadays, man, like a live service game scares the crap out of me. I mean, you just look at down the list of like every single game, you know, these communities and their Reddit communities and Twitter and all that stuff. People are just, you know, I don't know, like have these crazy expectations and it's just, I think I'm not sure what you can do to keep people happy, but it's, it's, that would scare the death out of me if I'm making a game that, you know, you're promising these two year, three year roadmaps on. Yeah, I think there's like a huge flaw too. And I feel like games as a service, you know, there's like certain games that have come out, like like the earliest game games that got tagged with the whole idea of games as a service were like Dying Light, The Witcher 3, right? Those were two games that released a bunch of free content alongside of like their paid content. And there were other games that did it. But I really think that live service games are just a front by like the corporate side of it, the business side of it to promise people content and then to turn around and just like oppress the work environment of their workers and normalize crunch. It's exactly what <laughs> Alex just typed that in chat as I was finishing saying that. Games as a service, he says, games as a service also heavily normalizes crunch and it is basically continuous development. That's exactly what I feel it is. It's essentially the publisher getting to make a promise and then lock a bunch of employees like into a work cycle that is, you know, for almost all these studios proven to be extremely unhealthy, which is why you know, like, you see very few games-as-a-service games, like, coming out of Ubisoft. You know, they're still over there, yeah. like, we've got the division, and that's it. And they've got the studios where they can literally turn everything into games-as-a-service. Instead, what they do is they release a game like Far Cry and Assassin's Creed, and their idea of games-as-a-service is to just do, like, small events that happen every month. Like, Origins had, you know, like, the Anubis fight and all that stuff, and... It's like super reasonable, like, you know, the content expectation for those sorts of games. And that's, I just feel like every game should just be, you know, developed instead like Monster Hunter. Like, I don't know what, if they crunch, <laughs> you know, yeah, but, yeah. but when you look at like the way content has been released for that game, it was like, okay, strong base game, you know, replayable. There's a, the team got to spend a lot of time just focusing on the core gameplay experience. Obviously Monster Hunter also has like 10 years of, you know, development practice, but nonetheless, when they said they had plans for the future, it wasn't like, oh, yeah, we're going to, you know, live service. This game's going to get updated, like, constantly, which, like you said, the community then takes it as, like, weekly. They're like, no, well, we're going to do, like, some monthly events, and then we'll, like, release these cool little things every now and then. And then we got one expansion. Like, and then what I see happening is, like, you know, you're going to have you're going to have these developers that start, you know, there's content ready from launch. They're going to start holding it because, hey, we, we were promised a live service. You know, developing games, I, I imagine, especially these AAA games, is not easy to just roll out polished AAA content. You know what I mean? That's why some of these games are in development for years. So then they start holding back content, you know, put it behind some sort of a season pass. And then on the flip side, you've got like the internet blowing up that, hey, this content's on the disc. Why aren't they releasing it? And it's, I don't know, man, that's like a, it's a no-win situation, it feels like, for, for a lot of these games. Yeah, and I don't think like... I don't think in reality development studios can even produce that much content to like hold content back. You know, like the, like the, like, you know, uh, Alex mentions Battlefield 5. You know, like Battlefield uh, essentially let its, like, th that whole team got put back in the exact same situation they were in when they made Battlefield 4, which is like two year development cycle, which isn't enough to make a Battlefield game, especially as they're dealing with Frostbite and like pushing forward and making huge changes to the tech. Uh, and so then the game was like crap at launch and it took like seven months for it to get really good. And Battlefield 5 is in that same position, but 
there's also no premium so people have these like really drawn out content schedules of like you know we're trying to fix the game plus make content it really does it just seems like it's a way for the executives and the publishing side of things to make a a promise to people so they're more willing to purchase the game and they're like i've even seen people say to me like somebody somebody told me uh what the hell? I think it was like when I was talking about Rage 2 like months ago. Somebody was like, I just need to see the roadmap before I buy it. And I'm like, what do you mean? There's no roadmap. <laughs> like it's, it's a single player game. If they if they do anything, it'll be... And they did. They actually launched a roadmap like a week ago. And it was just like, oh, event. And there's another event to get like a weapon skin. And then that was it, you know? Like it, it's... Yeah, you no, know you're spot on. I can't tell you how many times yet people are like, I'm not pre-ordering until I see what they're yeah what the next like year is and it's like man remember those days when you, you would just like buy the game and then you'd be pleasantly surprised with oh my gosh they're releasing an expansion <laughs> that's cool like yeah. and now it's totally expected that you you know whatever you're buying has got you know four or five expansion packs updates whatever and yeah it's a different time we live in i guess super weird yeah i don't know <laughs> yeah i wonder what do you so what do you guys think too like i'm just thinking about so og and i were talking about this the other day so you, you know even something like when we played titanfall right you buy titanfall 2 60 dollars box game you go through you're customizing your character hey look at all these cool camos you have right you're unlocking all these camos just by playing the game you get you know their currencies you get the little um you know packs after you complete a match and then on the flip side you've got a game like apex where right you basically start off with nothing and then you know you're paying a dollar or two for all of these loot boxes and stuff at the end of the day like you know what's your preference on just like that model do you do you prefer the free-to-play model hey base entry you get in there but then you, you feel like you're being nickel and dimed or you know would you be willing to even at some point right if, if game prices start going up because you know these developers need to try and make some money that they were making on a free-to-play model that maybe a game costs you know eighty dollars something like that would you be willing to make that jump knowing that like, hey, you're getting a lot of this stuff, you know, right out of the package and it's not coming out of these, you know, random rolled boxes? Yeah, I, I think I'd, I'd be more than willing to pay pay a bit more just to get the full game, the full experience. Because what, what are the chances you don't get some of these items, you know, and you spend what, hundreds, some of these people hundreds of dollars to get the heirloom? Yeah, the heirloom thingy. And I, I still don't have it. I've opened a lot of packs and, you know, I've, I think I've spent probably more money on Apex, unfortunately, than I probably have spent on Titanfall. And even the, the concept of like free to play out of the box is like, oh, you know, you get the full thing experience, but you know, for, and I'm sure for some, they get some good value that have no intentions of ever buying a skin. But I think there's like this weird other side of it for the really hardcore where, man, that game is gonna end up being way more expensive than a, you know, a $60 box game at the end of the day for, you know, for guys like us yeah that's really what they bank on you know like that's just the way the whole system was essentially built i think it'll be interesting to see like i don't i don't want to say i prefer either because i think they both suck and i think it's like <laughs> at the end of the day there's there really isn't a reason financially that these businesses can't just go back to just producing a game like 70 dollars, whatever price they decide you know it, it's it's supposed to be now 60 70 bucks out of the box, boom, no like monetization, no microtransactions. Like we rarely ever get back to that discussion anymore because it's so normalized that, you know, it's just like, oh, but there needs to be because game development is expensive. But the reality is you just have like CEOs taking home, you know, millions of dollars every year. These corporations are making like exponential profit. And the moment they don't make exponential profit, they just like shutter a bunch of studios, even though they can completely afford to uh to do it and then you've got everything that happens obviously with the shareholder side of it it's just such a it's such a cluster of like capitalism and like when you hear people say you know the industry is unsustainable it's in part the constant crunch that is driving you know those very people who make the games we love out of the industry you know it's the reason that like old bioware doesn't even exist anymore none of them are even in game development for the most part so it's like and i feel like that like that phenomenon is like really impacted you know mainly like triple a studios i mean you still like you know what we're looking at here you know steam is still a great place and even like the xbox live or psn marketplace you know you can get a lot of these indies you know you kind of buy it up front you get the experience but they don't seem to be as at least yeah on the, at a really high level not impacted by that but it just seems like the triple a games industry is just plagued with with like that nonsense 
Yeah, I mean, you know, it's just it's just the difference between like a game developed with a massive corporation controlling the creative decisions to influence, you know, their their profits, and then like some random indie studio made up of like ten people who literally just make the exact game they want. But obviously, for them, they have to deal with, you know, the same thing that we deal with is just like some random dudes just on the internet trying to like make a living doing YouTube and like Twitch and stuff like that. Is we're just in the sea of everything, you know, and that's just how like indie games are. You know, not every there's like a million great indie games out there how many of them you know don't even we don't even know they exist they're buried somewhere on steam and they're actually awesome they never got coverage or they never even made it to steam or they did release and you know they might have been like successful because we're like we played them but really they sold like crap you know like it's yeah it's it's two very different spaces and while the one doesn't get influenced by all of the microtransaction nonsense you know they they unfortunately don't get to have like this is the sustainability the same, yeah. that these AAA companies like claim they don't have when they totally do have it, which is why it's really nice to see Respawn just being like, dudes, no. When we have content, we'll have content for you. You know, like they have no concern. They're not over there just like, you know, feeding into like the 10 idiots on YouTube who are just like, it's dying. They betrayed us. <laughs> like the, the videos I've seen about Apex, man, just make me want to like slap people in the face and then slap myself in the face a couple times <laughs> shake myself i think um it. yeah I, th I think like you know and i'm kind of the same with you tony i think you know I'm, I'm glad that respawn is wanting to put out like you know that quality product. i think their main thing where they can they can focus is probably just their communication piece you know i know jay posts every now and then but i think people really respond positively even when there's no news to share right the fact that just like hey we're checking with the community here's what we're doing you know we hear you like i think that stuff goes a long way and and even for some of these live service games, I think it, you know, for those people that are starving for something new, that at least like helps, you know, ease some of their concern or their frustration is just to know that, hey, there are people over there listening to us, you know, we've got some big things coming, we might not be able to talk about it yet, but, you know, yeah, trust, me, trust me, we hear you. It's so hard because, you know, like they still, they recently just kind of like said that, right? Um, and it's like a part of me always just wonders like how long does it actually keep those like the sharks at you know at sea if you will like some people just seem like they want them to just be like you know like i was talking about earlier they just want like this constant earpiece you know like they need this constant thing where it's they believe you know a lot of people treat it like they invested in this product and it's like i mean you didn't you bought a product you know like you're not like an investor like i, I get that people want to see what's going on I guess I just don't know, like, what does it take to even please people? You know, like, uh, like the division, for example, massive runs their like division live streams all the time, and you still have people who will sit there and be like, they don't tell us anything. And I'm just like, what do you mean they have a live stream like every week? <laughs> yeah, I think Ubisoft does a really good model that I know, like their Ghost Recon team, they have a little check in every week. They just play, you know, Wildlands with their community for an hour. I think the division does the same thing. Um, you're you're still definitely not gonna appease those those super hardcore that yeah just want to be spoon fed everything but i i do like their model you know you know that they're out there they hang out with their community they're playing their game talking about it and they you know not every single stream obviously they're announcing new content they obviously can't do that but it's it's kind of cool to just see see them check in and be enjoying their community a little bit yeah i would like to see before i went on that rant i that was going to say i would i would like to see respawn do something like that though i think it would be cool for them to put together some sort of a community stream team um you know whatever if they gotta hire new people call us up <laughs> um yeah you know, you know I mean, to like cool sit down with the like community and, and just interact and yeah play the game yep. like you know people Jay like to see that hanging out for an hour a week would be cool yeah bring in any devs you can every now and then to talk about you know just the game like there's so much people don't know about you know like the design of apex right like even if they're not talking about new content you can just have the devs sitting there just being like, oh yeah, this is how we made that decision to do this. Like, I know they talk about that stuff on Twitter, but you know, that makes great community content. And that's something that, yeah, like you, Ubisoft, you said, they do really well. Like all their teams have stuff like that. Even Borderlands now, um, you know, they, they have like their team. They're streaming like every other day. They've got like a bunch of Gearbox devs like playing other Borderlands games. I mean, and like they've only got like you know they got like 300 people watching them but they're building up that community just like ubisoft did um but it'd be super cool and yeah like you said they got garza man garza loves that stuff he's all into like vlogging and stuff they've got like the people on the team there um you know i don't know that they have time in their day but if they don't like yeah get some other people that would be awesome i'm i'm anxious for like our you know 
our E3 reactions podcast, right? I think that's going to be really interesting. They've been kind of teasing right that they're, or at least hinting at they've got some some big things coming up for for E3, whatever they're going to show at EA Play. There's a part of me that's thinking like, okay, they've been, you know, they've been pretty quiet. You know, they're not necessarily doing these things. I remember very early on when Apex was launching, you know, they talked a lot about that's some of the things they they aspired to do. And I got to imagine, right, you know, like most developers, you know, they see what people are talking about. They read the tweets. You know, I know Respawn's pretty active on Reddit. I'm very curious to see, you know, what they're going to be doing at E3 and if, you know, if they do have any plans to do stuff like that. I think new map, right? They said, like, if it seems like they're going to be, I, I feel know. like there'll be something like, we're, well, it seems like it's been pretty much confirmed now we're going to see season two at EA play. Yep. So I feel like, you know, whatever, I feel like at this point, they're pretty quick. Like, that's one thing. Like, I know people, like, you got these people who feel like it's taking forever, but like <laughs> respawn like put together an entire battle royale in two years like you know like yeah it was kind of off assets they already have but that doesn't matter you know they built an entire game like with all these crazy systems and these legends and stuff like that um you know i feel like give them three months and you know they're gonna do some pretty special things i think season two is gonna be really impressive and uh yeah i'm definitely looking forward to that um i guess Let's talk about some other stuff. Count, you, you've you been playing Rage 2. I've been playing Rage 2. Yep. I'm curious what you, what you been think playing of it. Too, right? OP, you've been playing yep. too, right? Yep. We've all been, been playing, playing, all been playing Rage 2. What do you guys think of it? So, where, are you, where are you guys kind of at, like, in the game? Like, how, how long you been, how long you into it you think you are? I'm probably about maybe only, like, three or four or five hours, somewhere like that. So, um, you know, I've done a couple story missions. I've been doing a lot of like the, you know, the outpost clearing and stuff. I've actually been really enjoying that. I'm a, I'm a really an OCD like map clearer. Yeah. So, you know, I'm whenever I'm driving there. around, I see a little icon on my map. <laughs> and stop. then what it makes it even worse is like this game definitely takes inspiration from the Mad Max portion of that, where, you know, you go into the little outpost and then you've got your little checklist on the top left, right? Like, yeah, clear yeah, all I've the got, boxes. <laughs> yeah. And then, dude, I cannot leave that area until you find that one box. And I find I spend a lot of time looking for that one last box, but I really enjoyed the shooting. I think, you know, it has got some of the best like shotguns in, in the industry that it feels so freaking good. You know, you got that little pulse when you ADS it, send people flying. Um, I've been really enjoying it so far. What's your OP? I, I was, to comment on what Count was saying about the box, there's actually a perk you can get that shows like a little Wi-Fi signal, like when you're close to boxes. So keep an eye out for that. Yeah. Need that, it. That seems cool. <laughs> yeah, you'll, yeah, you'll probably get it. Like the way you play Count, like me, you'll get it at the 13 hour mark because that's when I got it. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it, it takes a long time if you're not doing the main story missions because you have to get to Doctor Kavasser and then like unlock his project trees, and then you can okay. get that. <laughs> it's just like, I yeah, I I um I still don't even have like I've seen some people playing like I was watching Shroud play a little bit, and I think within like the first six hours he like had already just went and, like he just went and got all the arcs I think to get all the weapons, um and then I was watching him and he had to be man like at this point next time i checked it out he had to probably be like almost 20 hours in the game and he just did the pre-order mission he like just didn't even know it was the thing and he like went and did the pre-order mission and i was like i did this in the first two hours <laughs> like it's funny how everybody ends up like taking completely different paths because the game just you know basically says yeah go wherever you want to go that's kind of cool though i kind of like that yeah you're right i mean i've talked to a few people that had a totally different experience of you know how'd you get that gun how'd you get that perk what'd you do you know, oh, I haven't seen this part of it. And it's like, how far are you? And I'm like, oh, two hours in. They go, how, I've been playing for eight. How did you already get that kind of stuff? <laughs> you know, I kind of enjoy that. Just sort of, you know, go explore the wasteland and, you know, see what you find. Yeah, I love it. It reminds me. It really does. It reminds me so much of Breath of the Wild. Breath of the Wild's like such a game for that sort of just total player, like freedom of discovery. And it also creates, you know, then situations. I had one where... I ran into a shrouded uh, outpost. It was like level six and I was only like three hours into the game. And you know, that's like the first time I ran into the shroud and I realized, oh, they have body armor. Like, it's like taking forever for me to take the body armor off. So I go and like get some resources and I spend some felt and weapon core mods to get armor piercing rounds on my pistol, uh, thinking it'll like be enough. And then I just still got stomped out. So I left and I actually ended up like going back to that outpost for a side mission I got from one of the towns like at hour 11. And then I was super geared out at that point with like abilities. I just gotten a bunch of feltrite from doing like the, I just clear an outpost like you're doing. And I just like tore them to pieces. And I was like, see, that's like that sweet redemption arc. 
it makes that stuff so good so i i know there's been a lot of you know criticisms on a lot of the reviews that i've been seeing about you know that the, the gunplay and all that stuff feels really good but the world is is felt pretty barren have you experienced that at all i don't i don't think i'm at that point yet you know i, I kind of been enjoying driving around i think the game looks beautiful the sunsets are awesome you know it's got a great skybox i've been enjoying kind of like the the random things i i run into on the road have you have you run into that experience at all i think the real problem is like just the the narrative like of the entire world is really bad like in my opinion it's poorly written it doesn't make sense there's almost like you know when you build a sci-fi world it's important that the player like at least understands a few ground rules for why things exist you know like even looking at anthem they make a pretty you know clear-cut description of why the freelancers are who they are and why they can pilot the javelins when few other people can there's like high level details right where you learn like later on like oh this is how they communicate with the javelins but there's at least a basic understanding and rage 2 is always rage has been really bad at that in general like they carried over the nanites from the first game but they do almost nothing to like help you understand why rangers have nanites or why there's like a billion mut mutants everywhere and then like all the characters you run into in my opinion are just kind of like it's like they tried too hard to make it gross wastelandy you know for me yeah like everybody's mutated everything you run into there's something to do with the mutant and like it just it just doesn't feel like a i don't know it's not i know it's not supposed to necessarily be like a place where you feel welcome but it's a video game so like yes like even mad max has places where you kind of feel welcome you know as barren and as like desolate as that world is that's the problem i have with rage i go to like the towns and i'm just like i don't even want to spend time here like it looks cool and i'll take all the screenshots you know i possibly can of wellsprings at night but i don't want to go sit in the tavern and like you know pretend to have a drink at the bar like in skyrim you know you walk in from the cold and you sit down in the tavern the bard starts playing music and you're like god this is the best thing ever metro does that a great job of that too or like total desolate wasteland you're outside crazy monsters you go down in the metro people are playing guitar by the fireside rage has like none of that part of its like narrative or its theme it's just constantly like everything sucks and everything wants to kill you <laughs> and it, i just find it not that interesting that part of it i've definitely noticed that in yeah a lot of like the towns and stuff you know there's a there's a ton of npc characters that have dialogue boxes and i have no interest in talking to them it's like just drawn just out there they're them, kind dude. of uninteresting it, they just yeah, give you, you side quests through, like give me the damn mission. that's all they yeah. do yeah i have no interest whatsoever i've tried so many times to like just listen to what they have to say and i'm just like you're just you're not presented in a way where i care about you unfortunately like you know that's like all the part of that i think just the narrative being like really just distorted it, it just all you really know is like i'm really powerful must kill bad people you know like you just feel like such a brute like to the point where you have no compassion the game doesn't allow you to develop any compassion for any of the people in that town and that kind of sucks because like i'd like to be like yeah i'm a ranger you know there's even the one character like when you first show up in wellsprings he's like oh you're a ranger you're supposed to like help and rescue people well i need you to help find my cousin and i'm just like okay whatever where's the yeah where's the, i don't even know if i've even done the map done the mission yet you know whereas like a game like the witcher you show up in town and they're like oh my son has gone missing and, and Geralt's like you know you kind of have your little dialogue tree and then you're just like all right i'll do it and i'm a good witcher so no i don't need your money and you know and then like there's just passion behind the characters the character talking to you Geralt has passion and so then you feel like yeah i want to go help this you know lady find her son like what the hell man what's going on here even red dead like did it you know does a decent job of that like <laughs> this game just none of that <laughs> it's completely right, soulless on that take front. on a side mission you kind of care or you're investing why you're doing x y or yeah rage just is like check it off give me the experience give me the it's loot it's such whatever. a gameplay driven yeah, sandbox yeah like nothing else matters uh, and i that's why i can totally understand why people were like no i hate this game it's like if you don't like you know creative like gunplay driven sandboxes what there's literally no reason to play rage 2 i would not recommend it to anyone who doesn't like to shoot ai enemies no matter how good the ai are like they're phenomenal you know they jump all over the place and they're hard to hit they do things like throw grenades back at you after you've thrown them back at them but like if you don't care then there's literally nothing in this game for you you know in terms of gunplay though I, I do think that it feels pretty good I, I have been enjoying like a lot of the weapons I've been picking up you're right like shooting people feels good it's got a good sense of feedback um you know the wing stick obviously is super fun 
to throw at people. You know, I've been enjoying that. So, you know, convert. If the, I guess if you do like, you know, just sort of, you don't care for a story, you just want to run around in a beautiful world, shoot some stuff, you know, maybe that is, maybe that would be up your alley if you're looking for something like that. Yeah, I mean, it's a good like emotionally free game. Like there's there's you don't have to make any emotional commitment to play this game. It's not like sitting down and playing Mass Effect or a Telltale game where you're like, all right, I'm going to have to sit here for 45 minutes, walk away, go eat dinner, and come back and decide how I respond to this character. Rage is not that game, <laughs> you know? And maybe Rage 3, they'll get id and Avalanche, and then they'll hook up with a bunch of ex-Telltale people, and they'll make the perfect first-person shooter that also has a good story with characters we actually care about because... It's kind of how it feels like things are slowly coming together. It was like, oh, Id's over there. Like, we make good first-person shooters. And, um, you know, the team at Avalanche is like, well, we make cool open worlds, but, like, our shooting and gunplay is basically non-existent. And so then they came together. And so now you have, like, this really good gameplay experience. But both of those studios, Doom, six, Doom 2016 aside, because it actually has a really good sci-fi story, aren't that great at storytelling, you know? So it's it's like I totally expected it to be what it is. I guess at the end of the day, which probably helps set my expectations. Yep, yep. So R Rage Two made me want to replay Doom again, just like the mechanics and everything. Just I'm just like, you know what? I need to play Doom. Right. I hope like, and that's the thing too. You see Doom, like Doom Eternal's gameplay, and it looks mm -hmm. like a big part of that is them like looking. How do we expand the you know the player toolbox to create an experience that is probably going to be closer to Rage Two, and then. We'll hopefully get like a really cool sci-fi story. I loved, you know, Doom 2016 story was phenomenal, man. It's it's funny because it's the perfect example of what Rage 2 needed to do. Like, you are literally this, you know, voiceless Doom Slayer. Demons fear you. <laughs> like, they're like, no, don't open the crypt. Like, don't let this guy out of hell because he's going to kill us all. And yet, you know, you get like all this emotion behind his character. That opening scene in Doom 2016 where Samuel Hayden like is talking when you're in the elevator and he's just going on about how it was so important and your character finally is just like, dude, shut up and just breaks the comms. Like there's like, you know, a hundred times more character in that one scene than there is in all of Rage 2, unfortunately. Yeah. Total, total badass. All right. When is Doom Eternal? Is that Sometime fall? this year. That's all we no know. Yet. What yeah. they say it was supposed to launch with Stadia or something as well. Yeah. So, and I don't think Stadia is like the this year thing. So, I, the last I've seen is like estimates of quarter, like quarter four, twenty. So, like the holidays. Yeah, like fall. Yeah, yeah that makes so sense. E three news, hopefully. Yeah. So we'll see. Yeah, I'd love to see more of it at E three, because oh man, I mean, just it does. It looks like it's gonna have just this super cool, satisfying sandbox environment where. You know, that was like, I guess that's the thing a Rage 2 does really good, right? Is it, it really does reward you. If you get into the game, it rewards you for like swapping weapons and being creative and like mixing up, making your own combos. The first Doom like kind of did that, but I don't think it did it enough. And like, so that's where I really want to see Eternal Shine is to like really give me incentive to cycle through all of my weapons and, you know, go crazy and jump all over the place and use the new movement tech. So I hope Doom Eternal 2 gets a, gets a little multiplayer boost. You know, OG in our time, Doom 2016 multiplayer was really fun. Um, oh my God. So you know, good. had a good time with it. Just like it, it never picked up enough steam and the player base didn't really stay with it. But I mean, I, there was something there. Yeah, I personally didn't love it. I know it was made by actually um, the studio who's helped work on, well, Matt's, Max Hoberman's studio. Max Hoberman's like the guy who basically made Xbox Live and helped with Halo's multiplayer and Halo 2's online component. His team like worked on that multiplayer, which is why it had like Halo vibes. But I just I don't know. I never fell in love with it. I liked like bits of it, and I would like to see them like have another shot at it though. I feel like you know with all the new movement tech they're adding, like imagine a multiplayer game like that where you're like running around environments, double jumping, dashing, and swinging off of yeah, land, that's land what posts. I mean. You know, there's like potential. I think that, you know, there's. I agree. Yeah, and I mean they ha they have fun guns. You know, like going up and you know blasting somebody yeah double jumping grappling whatever fast pace you know rocket boosting hitting somebody with a shotgun i feel like they they've got something fun there that's you know maybe people are are clamoring for a little bit at least maybe i am yeah i think they just need to they need to just decide like how do you i think the problem that that 20 doom 2016's multiplayer had was it was like trying to i think replicate games like halo a little bit too much with like weapon pickups but also a loadout system. I think it was really confused about how it wanted to present like that base gunplay experience to people. 
and i think that's a problem that a lot of games have you know you like you play some games and you're like this game should have like weapon pickups because people aren't you know there's no incentive to like be pushed around the map so i don't know what the right direction is for doom a part of me is like make it like a class-based game where you know you have like a bunch of different doom slayer type characters and they have different loadouts with different abilities you know and let people kind of go at it but uh, yeah i don't know the right answer that was why i didn't love doom 2016 it just felt like you've got like crazy power-ups where you're like oh you can turn into the you know the skeleton guy with the rocket pack but then you've got like weapon pickups and loadout weapons and i was like there's just too much going on and none of it feels the house cannon yeah yeah like <laughs> it was it was like a bunch of cool stuff it just wasn't like refined enough for me to be like this is something i want to play again and again so i guess we'll see on that one um, that, that was the most powerful feeling, getting a Gauss cannon and seeing your opponents through walls and just one-shotting them. That was ridiculous, man. <laughs> Guns in that game. Uh, Alright, um, what, I mean, what else have you guys been playing? I got some stuff I could talk about. I don't know if there's anything else you guys were jamming on hard you were excited about. Um, so. Not really. Oddly enough, um, so I've been jumping back into, um, I've been playing some pokemon trading card game lately i was sure you were just talking I'd, about um that. yeah i went so i went to go see detective pikachu right uh last weekend and they give you like at amc they give you a little promo pack where they give you some cards so i'm like looking at the cards i'm like you know i used to play this game when i was younger i used to collect them and i was like i kind of missed this game i'm looking for something a little bit different right you know we play a ton of first person shooters right we're talking about rage anthem all that it's like sometimes i'm just looking for something i just want to like hang out you know play a little bit you know maybe think solve some puzzles whatever and i was like you know what i'm gonna see if um you know i can play this game and you know i don't know if everybody knows this maybe i was just late to the party but they have um they have an online version too that's it's a free to play but what was really cool to me and i you know i'm just learning about this is that if you're into like collecting the physical cards you know i think one of the the dynamics around you know why something i didn't want to play necessarily magic is right you can get addicted to like card collecting pack opening in the physical world and then there's also you know magic the gathering arena where it's like man this this game is going to cost me a million dollars if i want to get into it one of the cool things that that uh the pokemon card game has been doing is like if you buy a uh a booster pack you know go to target best buy whatever buy a booster pack they actually come with codes to unlock that same deck on the online game which is really freaking cool because you know you can it's a the online game is a great place to learn the game right they they automate a lot of those rules for you so you don't necessarily have to worry about you know bringing your buddy over who doesn't need to play and you guys are doing moves that like well, technically you're not allowed to do that you know the game controls a little bit what you can cannot do so it's a great learning ground and then at the same time you know if you're into collecting the physical physical packs you can do that too and i got turned on to last night which um i also thought was really cool is i guess there's there's like these third party sites that people aggregate you know, you've got a, a, probably this huge demographic of people that go to like their Friday night magic tournaments, whatever, go to conventions and play that just want to play the physical cards. And since each of those booster packs and starter decks come with these codes, um, there's all these like third party retail sites that people just sell those codes for cheap. You know, hey, 50 cents a quarter, something like that. So you can buy these codes and then redeem them in the online game to get those booster packs. So there's like a really cost effective way to even if you just want to play the online version, which is pretty cool. Yeah, that's awesome. I remember actually seeing that. I think I was trying to find something from Michelle and I to like play together, and I saw that there was like a, an online version of it, and I, I downloaded. It. I think we played it a little bit. It's so funny when I heard you say that. I was like, oh damn, dude. Everybody I've too always, is. Go ahead. You know, I was. Yeah, I've, I've always wanted to play Magic. I think somebody's trying to teach me how to play Magic. I was like just three or four gonna times. say they launched the uh, that new Magic Arena, the online thing. It's supposed to be pretty good. I know. Uh, Everybody, Alex, who's in chat's been playing that. I've heard like a lot of good things about it. Kotaku wrote like a really glowing article about how good it is. Um, just kind of like a more laid yeah, back way to reason, play the though, game. Like, Magic has been, you know, really hard. And maybe it's again because I've been trying to play with people that are like really, really seasoned experts at it, trying to teach me. And it's not the the easiest game to learn. But I feel like you know the Pokemon card game is fairly simple. I think it shares a lot of you know the core ideas from Magic, but that doesn't necessarily maybe go like the crazy depth that you can get into so i feel like it even for me you know wanting to play magic with some of my friends that that do that you know on a weekly basis it's kind of a cool stepping stone to just get me thinking about you know how do you how do you play these card games how did like the you know the mana or the the resource economies work because i you know not something i really never got into so it's kind of just been a you know a cool stepping stone I, I enjoy the art on the cards you know they're kind of fun to play um you know there's a whole bunch of different sets of variety there you know you recognize some of them from the game so i have like a little bit of a connection just from playing that when i was younger but 
you know so far i've been enjoying it that's kind of what i've been playing in my spare time there's a, a mobile version too so if you've got an ipad you know you've got your galaxy tablet whatever you know kind of a cool hey you want to you're just sitting on the couch watching tv you want to play a couple hands you know pretty small time commitment you know do some challenges do your daily challenges get some rewards open some packs you know there's a trading economy on the online game if you've got excess cards you know there's actually a marketplace where you can trade with other you know other players so been kind of enjoying that it's been a, a nice little diversion from some of the shooters that we play all the time yeah yeah that's awesome dude that's that's dope to hear i was i always wondered too like looking back at pokemon um yeah, I don't. I never like learned to play it as a kid. You know, it was just like collect the cards. I'm pretty sure my brother and my one friend like tried to tried to get me to play it with them one time, and I learned that they were just like making it up as they went along. And I was like, "You guys aren't even playing! Like, get out of here! <laughs> you're like you're just lying! You know, you didn't even learn how to play." It's like, "No, no, this is how you play it." And so I never like learned how until I uh, when I checked it out a few years ago with Michelle, and I was like, "Yeah, it is, it's definitely got a. It's just it does. It feels like a little bit more." Easy that basically access. sums up my magic experience you know i have some either i either played with somebody that is just so smart it's been playing that game for years that i'm just like i don't know i can't comprehend what you're telling me or you, you know you've got your jackass buddy they're like hey you know we got two starter decks let's play magic and we're probably doing all this crap that's like you're not allowed to do that but you know you got the rule book open you're trying to figure it out and it's like not the most enjoyable experience when you just want to play but you know nobody knows how but the the online games and i'm sure probably magic um arena is is very similar but it's just a cool way to let you know the computer control what you can and cannot do if you're out of moves you know there's nothing for you to do you end your turn if you've got a you know you're trying to make a move and hey you didn't you didn't play a you know a, a resource point or you didn't draw or whatever like it gives you prompts to help you understand like oh okay i get the flow of the game and then you can eventually start turning some of those tool tips off but you know it kind of takes care of the learning and the controls for you without having to necessarily scramble through a rule book with your buddies that's nice yeah you should if you if you do decide count to like try uh, mtg like arena has a pretty dope tutorial speaking of learning the game that makes it uh, a pretty nice learning experience but that's awesome dude i like card games are like one of those things i think i've like i've totally it's like M mmos they've dropped down on my list of like <laughs> things i like know i should start Always playing have wanted to just do based it, yeah. on time like i i reinstalled the elder scrolls online and i was like god i, I loved this game at launch even though it was a mess and it's even better now and i totally want to play it but i definitely don't have time and no one wants to watch anyone stream an mmo so let's just pretend i didn't even revisit it <laughs> but uh yeah i understand that oh you and i were just talking about uh earlier today we're like hey is that world of warcraft expansion coming out so oh, yeah there's God, mmos yeah, always right? on that to-do list is like i, won't even I want to play them so bad <laughs> i'm like just don't do it to yourself I think I own like every single World of Warcraft expansion and I play them for like a total of 12 hours before being like Okay, I can't I, can't, I don't have time for this. I didn't sleep today because I just sat here and played this. I can't do it Oh man, that's why the game that I've been playing is perfect. So I've been playing that Hades game um, It is actually on sale on the Epic Game Store right now and Epic's doing that thing where they actually like cover the cost So if you want to pick the game up, it's like eight bucks and you don't have to feel bad about it because the devs still get all their money. I actually bought it when it launched in early access. Never played it. I was like, I want to like sit down and have time for it. So I sat down and played it a little bit today. And dude, it is probably one of the best, I guess you call it a roguelite, roguelike uh, I've ever played, man. Even in its early access state. Like it's up there for me already with dead cells. Like it just has this wonderful learning curve. I've only put about two hours into it. But in the two hours I've played, I've already like, like grown so much as a player. And I don't know, dude, it's just, it's like, I guess the big problem for me is like roguelikes for a very long time, roguelikes, roguelites, right? The problem that they all had was like, they wanted to be replayable because that's the nature of the genre, but they weren't fun to replay for the most part. Like Rogue Legacy, I never really enjoyed. A bunch of other games that I just got like bored of after like five runs. And I feel like lately, a lot of these devs have been like killing it with these games that not only look beautiful, they sound beautiful, but they do. They're like super replayable because they have these wonderful little like learning curves baked into them. So with Hades, you've got like your starting weapon then like very early on the game introduces you to a bow and then a shield like within the first hour and a half you can get two other weapons that are completely different and as you're going through the levels getting like power-ups from the different uh the different gods of olympus that come to help you like those then modify your weapon completely differently because every weapon is unique but on top of that <laughs> You're not just using like your dodge and your dash and your abilities. The environment around you is like destructible and filled with traps. 
So not only can those traps hurt you, but you can use them against your enemies. So it creates this like really interesting, like almost like bumper ball style, like slash, you know, action, like slash them up type slash hack and slash type game, if you will, where you're not just like hacking and slashing. You're also like knocking down the ceiling and like bumping enemies into traps and triggering like fireball traps and stuff like that. And you basically just try and make it, you know, as far as you can. The whole story is that you are Hades' son and you're like fed up with his with his crap as your dad. He keeps telling you to clean his room. And so you're like, I'm leaving. I'm getting out of hell. I'm going up with the other gods. <laughs> and so they like come down and they're like, yeah, you belong up here. And they show up and like help you occasionally and give you different buffs and stuff like that. And it, that's like where an element of RNG comes into play. But just got this really wonderful like art style, the characters, the story. Every time you die, you get like reborn back in front of like your dad, right? And he's like, oh, you, you died again. Uh, don't worry, just me and uh, you know the dog, we're gonna be sitting here trying to figure this out. <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll just take care of things down here. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's, it's just got this really, I don't know. It's like, you don't expect to have like, to like play a roguelike and instantly find a bunch of characters you like really like, or for them to have a lot of personality. And like Dead Cells totally had that, just yep. oozing with it. And this game is just a bunch of it, man. I mean, Achilles is like, you're one of your like good friends and he's like helped you train in combat so when you come back after you die you can go talk to all these characters who are like oh don't worry you'll make it and you would talk to achilles who is this fallen hero now and he like gives you resources he gave me like an entire book like a bestiary uh and in like uh you know basically like a history book that i get to fill out now so as i go through and i take down monsters they get recorded in the book and it like tells you about their weaknesses there's so many layers to it and they've still got like another massive update planned for uh, I think it's like 20 days from now or whatever they're gonna do their next big update and they're gonna add like a whole nother zone another boss uh, Another like set of characters another weapon. There's already so much there. It's just like Even when it's not until I think it's 15 bucks. It's just one of those yep. games where you're like how is this only $15? <laughs> like, this is a $60 game, you know No, you're right. Though. That's pretty cool. I, I I'm kind of in the same boat as you I think that those roguelike roguelike games are they're tough, you know, yeah, that, that core game is obviously you die, you you lose your stuff, you start again, but a lot of them is tough. Yeah, like that replayability of, you know, I, I don't wanna do this again, or like, that seems like a sludge. I think that's a, that's a tricky one. Dead Cells, you're, you're right, does a really good job of, you know, making you wanna jump back in. I played another one, I think it was called Below. You know, that was a tough one. It was yeah, like, we I talked really about Below the, when we were at yeah. PAX. Yeah. And it was just like, you know, the, the core game was fun. I liked the, the, the art style, the music was cool, but man, like the loop, and the amount of time it would take you to get back to where you were was like really long and painful. And it was just like, okay, I'm out. So, you know, if some of these games can figure out like that, it's a cool, fun loop. It doesn't take you another two hours to get back your progress is like, you know, I think a really important thing for, at least for the that genre of games, the ones that I've been enjoying. Yeah, it's the one of the cool things too, to see like, so when you boot up the game, you can kind of like, you know, they give you like a quick way to just look at their development notes and, so along with their next update, and this has been like across the two updates they've done now, one of the constant things they've been focused on is adding ways to increase the replayability of the game. Like it's always been a part of their design goal. Like one of their pillars is to like, every time we release an update, we're also gonna try and do things that make the game more replayable, like more satisfying. It already feels like so good. Like it's just, it's weird, man. Like. I feel like usually three or four runs into a, ro a roguelike, I already can like pick apart something where I'm like, oh, there's like you already, like you're saying, you already start to feel that drain, that like lack of incentive to play more. But Hades is a game where like, I literally have no concern for what the end looks like yet. Like, and I feel like that's good. Like the game doesn't even have me thinking about the end. And so if I'm not yep. thinking about it, then I'm not like feeling frustrated that I'm nowhere near it. Like, I don't even really know where it is yet. I got to the first boss uh, and almost won and then lost and i was kind of like that's okay plus there's a lot of you know like a lot of these games trying to do now there's a lot of like residual uh, power-ups you can get so you have like these purple shards you can spend you like reflect in a mirror in your room and you can spec out uh, a selection of things to like you know give you health regeneration in some cases uh, and then you also get unique items by interacting with npcs you meet when you're out in like the dungeons of hell so the one guy uh, is I think supposed to be dragging like a giant stone skull up the stairs for Hades and he's just like <laughs> taking a break and he's like oh hey the prince like oh don't mind me I was just taking a small break and I happen to have this item and the game was like you know gift him the item I gifted it to him and he gave me this like uh this like 
ankle bracelet thing. And so you actually have a selection then of items that you can earn in that way over time and they have specific buffs and you can equip them. You can then also have like certain builds for your runs. You can have like, you know, a shield build with like the ankle bracelet or whatever else you might unlock. There's just so many ways you can play like within the first hour that it's like, you know, you can just do a bunch of trial and error essentially before you even worry about like making serious progress. It's a good game. I strongly recommend it. <laughs> really cool. Strongly recommend it. Um, I look into that. Yeah, it's like, like I said, especially for the price right now, man, like eight bucks, it's like two cups of coffee out somewhere. Like, it's just, it's so beautiful too. It's, it's one of those few times where I've seen a game, like I've watched people play it. I watched the documentary that Noclip did. And I'm like, that looks nice. But then when you play it on your screen, it's so sharp, dude. It's so crisp. Like, it looks like somebody went in and just kind of like drew things with you know, like really high end, like markers and, you know, line and line, line markers and stuff. Like there's just so many beautiful details to it. You just are, you get distracted initially. And then you're like, okay, like focus on like the combat and like dodging all these things, trying to kill me. But yeah, really, really impressive game. Strongly recommend it. Um, I think that's it, right? Like that's everything we've, we've kind of played for the week. How do you don't have anything else you've been jamming on? We covered just about everything. The only thing uh, that I did want to talk about is Void Bastards because I feel like no one really knows like about that game and everybody in chat should totally know about that game because it looks incredible. Um, and it's actually being made by a bunch of ex um, Bioshock devs. Like some of the some of the guys are from Bioshock. It's a very small team. Like the dude doing audio is literally doing all the audio design by himself. But the main premise of the game is that it is kind of like FTL. You guys play FTL at all? I know about it, never played it. So FTL essentially is like you're piloting a ship through space, right? And every time you stop at a new point, like there's a chance for something to happen. It takes that concept, but then gives you more of a persistent environment. It's less of a rogue like uh, than FTL is. So you are actually on this prison ship and these prisoners are basically sentenced to a life of going on out and stealing slash salvaging from derelict spaceships and sometimes active spaceships out in in space and so you actually have to like then go in and you know just use kind of items you find and break into these spaceships to steal like supplies and you're also gonna, always going to have like a specific item you have to get so like you know they'll send you in and be like oh you need to get this item so you have to go around the space station trying to find that item while dodging enemy threats and there's a big focus on like planning and prep and also like accepting that you can't always win so it's not just like a crazy blast em up first person shooter sometimes you go on a space station and be like oh they've got like high level robot guards so instead i'm going to go disable the security system so they can't track me with the cameras i'm going to get to the hall get the map and so i can like just get in and get out type deal and your prisoner that you play is randomly generated so you start with one prisoner when they die you get another prisoner and they all have their own background and their own buffs and the one that they demoed on stream the other day was so cool so the guy's a lifetime smoker and so he occasionally coughs and it gives his position away oh wow so the guy's trying to stealth and he's like i hope i don't cough right now it's like the, it's just a super cool like little rng element there's a bunch of crazy stuff like that. And, you know, obviously, if you've seen footage of this game, like the comic book art style is way over the top cool. But I'm I'm hyper stoked for it. It's like a, it's one of those simple concepts, but there's so much nuance to the way it's delivered. There's like crafting systems in place. So you can, you know, make different weapons. There's like all the weapons are kind of put together with like junk. So they look really like scrapped together. And uh it just looks phenomenal, man. I'm, I'm super excited about it. It's just one of those games that kind of came out of nowhere like a few months ago. I saw it, and then I was like, man, this just looks phenomenal. Yeah, it looks really cool. So that's that's actually releasing it's the end of this month, 29th, I believe. So if that looks like something that might tickle your fancy, uh, the devs are like very much inspired by you know FTL, like System Shock 2 is another game. You know, they got a lot of like space sci-fi aesthetics going on, a lot of weirdness. Uh, definitely check that one out. That about wraps it up. A lot of games, man. I actually don't know what comes like what we kind of are about to hit the summer lull though, aren't we? Mm -hmm. There's not really much gonna be happening <laughs> over the next until like what's the next big release? Is it literally Borderlands? And that's it? Maybe we'll get some stealth stealth drops of E3 this year. Oh right, yeah. Maybe a bunch of devs will show and you're like, it's out today, <laughs> beta today. 
Yeah. There's a couple like random games I'm excited for. That Remnant game I've talked about made by the team that made Darksiders. I'm looking forward to that. That's in August, but there's literally nothing else. So uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. I think that about wraps it up. Thank you guys all for joining us so much today. Um, yeah, games and stuff. I really don't know what else to say. There's a lot of games to talk about. <laughs> we, we covered a lot of stuff today. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, be sure to check out Void Bastards. Again, I cannot recommend Hades enough. It's made by Supergiant Games. They're an awesome studio uh, full of great people who absolutely go out of their way to make games that really try hard to earn your dollar. So if you're looking for something like that, you can sit down and play in sessions. I uh, strongly recommend checking that game out. Available on sale on the Epic Game Store right now. They did not pay me to say that. It's just awesome. Check it out. That's going to do it for us. We will see you all in the next one.